Moving a spaceship fast is all about having as much energy as you can for as little mass as possible, and when it comes to dense power sources, not many things beat plutonium. So today we return to the Upward Bound series to look at atomic rockets. We are going to explore the basic concept and talk about using it safely. Last time we talked about chemical rockets, and how we could measure their efficiency in terms of their exhaust velocity or specific impulse, the higher the better. Fundamentally those depend on the energy released when you burn them, that accelerates the new formed chemicals to high velocities and we direct them the opposite direction we want our rocket to go. The energy stored inside particles that is released by fission reactions is generally around a million times greater. Tapping that energy to provide thrust is a lot trickier, but if you can do it safely without adding too much weight and in a fashion fast enough to provide thrust, you have one heck of an engine. This is easier said than done, but let's start by looking at the basic concept. I don't want to spend too much time on fission because we could do whole episodes on that, and maybe should at some point too, but not today. The key thing is that lots of elements in their isotopes are not very stable and prone to decay. Some, like Uranium-235, take hundreds of millions of years to do this on their own, but if we manage to get a neutron nearby and moving slow enough to be captured, we can cause a reaction. Instead of decaying, the nucleus will split into barium, krypton, and three more neutrons. If we slow those down, they can get absorbed by other U-235 atoms, causing them to split, or fission, and emitting more neutrons, continuing the chain of reactions and emitting a lot of energy. And it is a lot of energy. As mentioned, generally speaking the energy being released by a kilogram of fissionable material is about a million times greater than a kilogram of chemical fuel, or what we can store in our densest batteries. Needless to say, we would very much like a power source that dense, because there are only a few more alternatives that are better. We've actually talked about those three, fusion, antimatter, and black holes, on other occasions. They are in a similar range though. 10 to 1000 times better than fission in terms of energy density, but fission is still a million times better than chemical power, and unlike those three, we have entirely functional fission reactors already. We also have entirely functional fission rocket engines. Unlike a lot of the systems we have discussed in this series, these are not just on paper. We have built and tested a few of these, even before we landed on the moon, we just never used them. Now as you might guess, with the space program going on in the 1960s and us already having nukes and fission power plants by then, some folks considered using it for rocketry and both the US and Soviet Union experimented with the concept. The big program for this for the US was Project Rover. The main focus of that was nuclear thermal rockets, which is pretty simple as a concept. The name explains the concept, you are using nuclear power to heat up some propellant usually liquid hydrogen, we turn that nuclear energy into thermal energy and let that superheated liquid hydrogen, now a vapor, go flying out the back. There's nothing radioactive about what gets sprayed out, you're just using the reactor to heat the hydrogen up. It does a lot better than chemical rockets, which tend to have specific impulses of a few hundred seconds, this atomic rocket hits about a thousand, which is a huge difference but nothing like what you'd expect considering the energies involved. We are limited in this regard because all we are doing is heating up the hydrogen and we can only heat it so much without melting stuff. We call this specific design a Solid Core Nuclear Thermal Rocket, or Solid Core NTR. Now with an effective specific impulse of nearly a thousand, this design was quite capable of lifting objects to orbit better than chemical rockets, much better. Where your typical rocket is virtually all fuel, a solid core NTR can lift close to an equal ratio of engine and payload mass into orbit. But we have that concern of the thing blowing up and throwing radioactive materials all over the place. This concern is not helped by us trying to run everything as hot as possible. Those kinds of temperatures put all sorts of stresses on the components, and even the fuel rods are going to be expanding and cracking from all that heat. 
The biggest thing working against this engine early on was not the radiation issue though, it was the weight. Reactors and engines back in those days were quite heavy, they still are, but we've learned some tricks since. It doesn't matter how high something specific impulse is, to be useful it has to be able to achieve a better than 1 to 1 thrust ratio. As mentioned the last episode, specific impulse is measured in time, but that's not how long a rocket typically burns, in fact it has to burn in a shorter time than that or it won't get off the ground. A fuel with 400 seconds of specific impulse could hold a rocket hovering off the ground in Earth gravity for about 400 seconds, less since not all that rocket is fuel. That's when it has a 1 to 1 thrust ratio, exactly balancing gravity. Burn it faster and it will go up, burn it slower and it won't get off the ground. That's the problem with things like ion drives, they've got huge specific impulse, but they expend that over an even longer time. Not coincidentally, most things melt at the kind of energies chemical reactions generate, since they are chemical bonds, so it isn't too surprising that a lot of things that would let us heat a propellant up even hotter than burning rocket fuel also tend to require either very slow usage or construction from some super material that won't melt under those energies. We have some clever solutions to help with this, like cooling the rocket nozzles with the fuel, but fundamentally it is the same sort of energies binding materials together chemically as what we get from burning chemical fuels, and nuclear energies are on an order of a million times larger. In a jet engine, we create a cool layer of air around the walls of the burn chamber and most of the fuel gets burnt inside a smaller tube of air in the middle, this keeps those components from heating up as much. Unfortunately, this does not help the solid core, which is producing all that heat in the nuclear thermal rocket, so our limiting factor on temperature is the core melting. The speed of exhaust particles is strongly related to temperature higher temperature, faster speeds of the particles, going with the square root of the temperature in Kelvin. Quadruple that temperature, double that speed. But it also relates to the mass of those particles inversely, quadruple their mass, half their speed. If you take a sample of gas composed of various chemicals, but the same temperature, and measure their speed, you will notice a big difference. The oxygen will be moving a bit slower than the nitrogen on average, as diatomic oxygen molecules are just a little heavier than diatomic nitrogen. Carbon dioxide weighs more than both, and will be slower. Helium, being monoatomic and much less massive, moves much faster. Hydrogen is even faster, though since it is diatomic too, it isn't too much faster than helium. Since diatomic oxygen weighs 16 times more than diatomic hydrogen, the hydrogen will be moving 4 times faster at the same temperature. Again, that speed also goes with the square root of temperature, so at 4800 Kelvin, 16 times higher than room temperature of about 300 Kelvin, that speed would be 4 times higher, meaning diatomic hydrogen is moving about 16 times faster at those temperatures than oxygen is in the air you're breathing right now, 480 meters per second. Now that speed for diatomic hydrogen at 4800 Kelvin is about 7700 meters per second almost orbital velocity, and would be a specific impulse of 785. Lone hydrogen atoms are even better, they would be moving at about 11,000 meters per second, higher than orbital velocity and about Earth's escape velocity. Of course just about every metal is melted by then. Tungsten, the previous record holder, melts at just 3700 Kelvin, and the Sun's surface isn't much higher at 5800 Kelvin. Though we do have a new material made of hafnium, nitrogen, and carbon with a melting point of more than 4400 Kelvin. Anyway, that is why we always talk about hydrogen offering the highest specific impulse or exhaust velocity, as long as your main method of imparting energy to your propellant is heat, you always do best with the lowest mass particles you can find. To get around the issue of core melting, we have some variations on the basic nuclear thermal rockets besides the solid core. These include the liquid core NTL, the vapor core NTL, or the gas core NTL. I don't want to go into the mechanics of these, but they let us get the propellant hotter without melting everything. The gas core is probably the best of these options, potentially allowing between 1500 and 5000 seconds of specific impulse. 
In this configuration, our uranium is in a gas form and isn't touching the reactor walls around it. We keep that gas spinning around in a toroidal shape, a donut, and potentially even magnetically confined, using a similar concept to what we contemplate for the Takamak fusion reactor. But if it isn't touching the reactor walls, how does the heat get to the propellant? In the open cycle version, which offers 3-5 to thousand seconds of specific impulse, this uranium gas can get to about 55,000 Kelvin, 10 times hotter than the surface of the Sun. And this is very awesome, except that when we say, open cycle, it does mean that the exhaust includes uranium. This means the use of an open cycle gas reactor would probably qualify as a war crime. See a normal solid core rocket, if it blows up, would scatter fragments of uranium-235 through the area, but that's not too huge a problem, relatively speaking. U-235 is an alpha emitter, making it pretty safe to handle. You could juggle chunks of it without fear of anything more than breaking your wrist, as the stuff is quite dense and hard. The alpha particles can't penetrate your outer layer of dead skin, it's only dangerous if you ingest or inhale it. Needless to say, if we're spitting out a plume of propellant that contains uranium gas among the main hydrogen propellants, this is going to result in folks inhaling it. So that makes it good for space-only applications, far from Earth, but not for on or near Earth. Now we have an alternative form of this called the Closed Cycle Gas Core Nuclear Thermal Rocket, which being a bit of a mouthful is usually called a nuclear light bulb. In the closed cycle version of this, we line the wall with quartz and let the ultraviolet light being produced by the very hot radioactive gas to pass through into our propellant. This gives it the nickname of the nuclear light bulb. This achieves a higher specific impulse than the normal solid core, 1500 to 2000 seconds, but not as high as the open cycle. Still, since it can achieve a thrust-to-weight ratio of better than 1 to 1, this design should be buildable to get into orbit. That more or less exhausts the on-planet uses, and with the concern folks have with nuclear vehicles, it isn't too surprising none of these have ever flown, and the Solid Core NTR was the only one built and tested. They do work though, obviously we need some prototyping for anything but the Solid Core design, but the constraint here is all about safety concerns, not engineering difficulties. For instance, the nuclear light bulb is quite safe unless it blows up on the way up, venting all that uranium gas into the air. Needless to say, while these things work, and even the Solid Core NTR is vastly better than chemical rockets, nobody's been pushing hard for more R&D and deployment of them, but you could absolutely build a space plane that ran on these methods. People tend to be a lot more open to using them away from Earth though, and we also have some more designs that work better there. Any of the designs we discussed so far walk off planet too, but they can walk on planet because they can achieve enough thrust to get off the ground, which is to say, they can burn their fuel up faster than its specific impulse. Away from Earth this doesn't matter, gravity isn't trying to drag you down. These things all have specific impulses measured in minutes, but up there it doesn't matter if you need to spend a whole day burning through it, or even weeks, just so long as your burn time isn't longer than your trip. This gives us our first option, which is just a nuclear reactor providing power to run an ion drive. We discussed these more in the Spaceship Propulsion Compendium, and it's the same concept, you use a magnetic field to accelerate your propellant up to high speed. The reactor provides the electricity for this. So can a solar panel though, at least near the Sun, though it takes a lot of them. So this isn't really an atomic rocket any more than the computer I make these videos on is an atomic computer, just because there's a nuclear power plant two towns over. Now I mentioned earlier that while we can cause fission reactions, typically by hitting the material with a neutron, those materials do decay on their own. Half-lives can range from less than a second to longer than the universe is old. For U-235, it is about 700 million years, which is why it makes up only a small portion of available uranium. Most of that is U-238, and we would normally say that a sample of uranium that we've removed the shorter half-life isotopes from was depleted of them, while one where we removed a lot of the U-238 was enriched. Depleted uranium is still pretty handy stuff, partially because it's so dense it makes great bullets and armor. It has a second use though, which is making plutonium. 
add a neutron to U-238 and it transmutes into Plutonium-239, which has a much shorter half-life. Reactors designed for doing that are called Brito Reactors, and we use the same idea for Thorium, adding to it and turning it into shorter half-life isotopes of Uranium. As a very loose rule of thumb, stuff tends to give off about one thousandth of its mass energy over the course of its half-life, so a handful of something like U-235 is going to be giving off milliwatts of heat energy, though it does it for around a billion years, releasing a million times what an equal amount of gasoline would release on combustion. Pick some radioactive isotope with a much shorter half-life, in the hundreds of years instead of hundreds of millions, and that same handful would give off kilowatts of power, not milliwatts. Polonium-210 is the isotope I usually hear considered for this. It is an alpha emitter and without any gamma, meaning it is easily shielded and decays directly to lead and has a half-life of 138 days, meaning that a single kilogram of the stuff generates about 140 kilowatts of heat. It is crazy toxic though, a microgram ingested will kill you. This sort of rocket, a radioisotope rocket, works much the same as the other kinds. You let it heat up a propellant, but it has no moving parts itself, it's just a big heater. We often use radioisotopes as a power source in space vehicles. A radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, produces heat that we turn into electricity with thermocouples. Those are not terribly efficient, 3-7% heat energy to electricity conversion tends to be the norm, but they have zero moving parts so they are very durable also handy for keeping the object warm. We use RTGs in space vehicles fairly often, and you just pick a radioisotope that's fairly cheap and has a half-life similar to the intended mission duration, or for a rocket, similar to how long it will be in transit, or for which you want to run the engines. The big disadvantage of course being that you cannot throttle it. It produces a set amount of power, slowly ebbing off before reaching half-power at the half-life. You wouldn't want to use one for trying to slow down after a long mission, for instance, since most of it would be gone when it came time to decelerate, whereas you can keep U-235 around a long while and just add it to the reactor like fuel when you need it, and you can throttle a fission reactor, though generally nowhere near as quickly as a combustion engine. Now a more efficient but slower accelerating version of this is the fission sail where essentially you are directly harnessing the decay particles rather than their heat. When a particle decays, it always conserves momentum doing so, meaning for a simple two-product decay, one particle flies in one direction and the other flies the other direction with the same momentum. It does so totally randomly, but if you stuck some on the back of a rocket behind some shielding, some would hit it, pushing it forward, and others fly backward. Since direction is random, generally this needs to be a sail some kilometers wide, with basically two layers, one an absorber and one behind it being the isotope. This idea comes to us from physicist and sci-fi author Robert Forward, one of the folks I tend to consider a spiritual patron of the channel, and he suggested it as an add-on for a solar sail, in that since it is already so big, we might as well let it reflect light and gain speed from that too. On a similar notion, we also have the Nuclear Photonic Rocket, a slow accelerating but high final speed ship that just uses the heat to push it along. Light has momentum, as we've discussed in other episodes, so if you can get your waste heat on a ship to radiate asymmetrically, you can get thrust, and of course this can be easily accomplished with either natural decay or standard fission by just having a sphere of the stuff getting hot attach the back of the ship inside a parabolic dish that is reflected to the frequencies of light being given off, infrared presumably. This is a very easy type of interstellar probe if you are just using a sphere of some radioisotope wrapped in an absorber. It won't get super fast and will take its sweet time doing it, but it can get to speeds that will get you to another star in centuries, not millennia, and the design is so simple you could bang one out in your garage assuming you don't irradiate yourself to death. We do have a few other designs like the Fission Fragment Rocket and Robert Zubin's Nuclear Saltwater Rocket, and these are strictly for off-planet use too. But the big one I want to spend a little time on is Nuclear Pulse Propulsion. I discussed this once before, way back in the Interstellar Colonization episode, 
and mostly bypassed it in the Spaceship Proportion Compendium as a result. This series is also mostly about getting off Earth, not to other solar systems, and this system is beyond useless for the former, so it will still only get a short mention today. The reason it is useless for planetary launch is that the Proportion utilizes nukes. Conceptually this is pretty straightforward, you shoot a nuke out behind you and it detonates, shoving your ship forward. Sounds crazy, but it's not as bad as you'd think in deep space. You stick a very large plate behind you made of a sturdy substance and on a huge spring. It gets walloped by the blast and slams forward, contracting the spring and then returning backwards, in much the same way the blast from a bullet on the bolt of a gun occurs, helping to distribute that sudden massive blast. When a nuke detonates in space there's not much of a shockwave, the atomized components of the bomb and a ton of gamma radiation. You build your pusher plate thick enough to handle the strikes and wide enough to catch most of that blast at whatever distance is the minimum safe distance behind the ship to detonate the nuke. These are big ships, multi-megaton ones bigger than an aircraft carrier. They can also use fusion bombs, not just fission bombs, letting you achieve even higher speeds with even bigger ships. This is the only interstellar ship design we have right now that could definitely take human passengers and deliver them to another solar system with no new technology. The low-tech version of it allowed you to get to Mars with quite a large ship in just four weeks, and it usually gets rated as a specific impulse of 6,000 seconds or more, one of the variations, the Medusa, having an estimated 100,000 seconds, and 1% of the speed of light is a realistic option with them. Also a handy way to slow a ship down as it approaches its destination if you're using lasers to push it up to speed, a technique we've discussed before too in the Interstellar Highway episode. Of course no discussion of nuclear proportion is complete without at least mentioning fusion, we might figure out how to do that tomorrow or 10 minutes from Doomsday, and it is something we have discussed at length elsewhere on the channel, especially in the Interstellar Travel Challenges episode. This has a lot of the same problems Fission has though, since you still have the problem of all that heat melting your equipment long before you maximize its use in speeding up your propellant. It's also one of the reasons I prefer photons as a propellant, they're already going quite fast. What's more, it is one of the reasons for why I regularly discuss fusion for interplanetary and interstellar craft, but I don't discuss it for getting off planets much. No engine is useful for this purpose, no matter how powerful, if you can't produce a thrust to weight ratio of better than 1 to 1. Some massive 500 gigawatt, 100,000 ton fusion reactor might make the space shuttle engines look weak, but still be as useful for launching itself into space as the Hoover Dam is. It needs to be powerful and light, and compact too if it has to fight through an atmosphere. But for operations once in space, Fusion would be amazing. We see a bit of an emerging picture though that the nuclear options aren't great for on a planet. Now a few forms can be used there, and it just comes down to if the engineers can make a design safe enough that folks would approve its use. Off planet the biggest issue would be finding fissionable material to operate them, since the radiation and disposal concerns are minimal. That makes them potentially very handy for operations with asteroid mining, since atomic rockets are excellent for moving cargo at those kinds of speeds and distances and there's no gravity wells for them to fight. However, asteroids generally will not have concentrations of uranium or thorium ores, that's more the product of geological processes on larger bodies, so Earth has plenty readily available to offer in trade to asteroid miners, and places like the Moon and Mars do too. Very little of the mass of nuclear thermal rockets is the fission fuel so shipping that out of gravity wells of those bodies is not a huge constraint. Normally at this stage of the episode I discuss safety and cost aspects, but that seems kind of pointless here. There's nothing very expensive about nuclear thermal rockets, though I'd imagine the R&D to fully develop them safely could get pricey. They should be a deal cheaper than chemical rockets, but estimating nuclear costs is always hard because of the safety and regulatory aspects. Those safety and regulatory concerns are the same ones for normal nuclear power and it seems like a bad idea to discuss those here. 
If you are pro-nuclear power, you don't need any convincing these can probably be done safely and that we wouldn't launch them if they were not. If you are opposed to it, there's nothing I can say to change your mind. Atomics is always a tricky one in that regard because it is genuinely dangerous stuff, so it's hard for me to yell at people about being overly afraid and cautious about the stuff, but I also won't pretend that I think fears of nuclear power are entirely reasonable either. Sadly, I can't say I expect those concerns to diminish in the near future, so in the end I can't say that I expect atomic rockets to see much use in Earth or low orbit. I suspect they'd only see a major role in space travel if we developed a fairly large off-planet mining and refining operation before we developed viable fusion. That is why we so often see nuclear propulsion designs as strictly space-based vehicles, not aerodynamic constructs. They mostly aren't expected to take off or land from planets, but rather move between them. Incidentally, I want to thank Animator and fellow YouTuber Fragomatic for providing some examples for today's episode. He does a lot of amazing animations of many of the concepts we've discussed today, as well as other spaceships and space habitats, and I've included a link to his channel in the video description. Make sure to give him a like and subscribe. In this series we've mostly looked about getting up into space. But once you get up into space, unless you just want to hang around in orbit, you need to go somewhere and nuclear proportion offers us some of the best options for that with our current technology. Now even if it isn't too suitable for launching ships directly to orbit, we will be looking at how nuclear power, fission or fusion, can help us get off the planet more as the series progresses. Indeed, powering the mass driver as we discussed a couple episodes back would be one such example. Most of the systems we will be discussing after this require very large amounts of power to function, and so are ideal for ground-based power plants where there's no fear of atomic fuel crashing to the ground or vaporizing over a huge swath of land to be inhaled. Indeed, since many of these launch systems would be far from human habitation, they are a lot safer for employing atomic energy. Now we will examine one such system, launch loops, in the next episode of the series. However, next week it will be back to the Existential Crisis series for Infinite Improbability Issues, and we are going to explore some of the stranger implications of concepts like the Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and alternate universes. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.